Hello, everybody. Atma Namaste. Welcome to the study session. I hope you have your books ready. So, before we go ahead, does anybody have a question? We can look at questions while we still have. Atma Namaste, ma'am. Atma Namaste. Just give me a moment. I'm just going to mute everybody. So, I'm not going to continue to. Yeah. Uh, go ahead with your question. I think you should be able to unmute yourself. Okay, hold on. Unmute. Yes, Theo. You put your hand up. Yeah. Hi, so, uh, Atma Namaste. So. Atma Namaste. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Like, what is the difference between theosophy and spirituality? Uh, between theosophy and spirituality. Uh, it's just the way that a particular school uh, talks about the teachings of all the great uh, schools, all the great religions. And so uh, the spirituality is a general term, like we say religion. Yes, okay. so there are different religions. So spirituality, there is spirituality also religion. Uh, but the distinction is not very, very clear. Whereas here, we only talk about, uh, for example, at this point, we're talking about mm. how we came about here. And okay. what is our journey forward? And okay. so in different religions, this is given differently. Yes. So if you look at uh, the Hindu scriptures, how we came here is different, uh, mm -hmm. slightly different from the, uh, from the um, Quran, it would be different from the Bible, it would be different. But yes. if you look at it, when we look at the studies here, we do not mix the religion. We just try to look at the essence of what is actually given there. So we okay. can understand how we are spiritual beings. And mm -hmm. what should be our spiritual journey forward? So you can go through a spiritual journey, even through a religion and through different okay. spiritual schools. Yeah. Okay. So what Master Chua says is every, every religion, every sp spiritual school definitely has its benefits. Okay. And so not to think that one is better than the other, but to realize they all come as we started to understand, come from the same baseline, the same truth. Okay. It's only been uh, narrated differently to us. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm really Thank you. Well. Atma Namaste, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes. Is, is that uh, Rudrakshi? Yeah, definitely. I am yes. Rudrakshi. Atma Namaste, ma'am. Atma Namaste. Tell me. Uh, ma'am, you explained about various... Please call me Sumi. I'm not very... I don't respond very well to ma'am. Uh, it's a very short um, thing. So just call me Sumi. Tell me. Uh, hey, yeah, yes. Um, <laughs> Sumi. Uh, um, ma'am, you explained about different planes planes seven planes and we are in the lowest plane that is the physical plane planes uh, yes uh, can uh, humans communicate with the different planes as you told uh, uh, there is spiritual plane there is a um, monarch plane uh, then the topmost is a divine plane can we communicate with them all right so um, like we mentioned in the session earlier when you are in the physical plane you are uh, it's easiest for you to go along with vibrations of the same level, right? To go into vibrations of a higher level, you need to allow your physical body to go to that level, which means you have to spiritually evolve to such a degree that your entire system, all your vehicles that you have, the physical, the etheric, the astral, the mental, go beyond its, its, its uh, present limitation. It transcends its present situation. So it can actually pick up on these uh, vibrations or sensations from higher levels. But at this point, for an average person, it's not possible. And at this point, even for us uh, to go to the, the highest two, which is the divine and the monadic, is going to be difficult. Maybe possible for someone who's already maybe uh, an arhat or a holy master or levels uh, above. Thank you, ma'am. You're most welcome. Thank you. Okay, hold on. Uh, yes, is that I'm going to go to Vidhi now? Okay, unmuting Vidhi. Thanks for shielding the seat. <laughs> no problem. Yes, uh, how come how come you're not getting unmuted? All right, there you go, Vidhi. Yes. Yes. Um, can I we get access to the first two lectures because I missed them? The first two sessions? Uh, well, at this point, I am not giving any of uh, what has been recorded. It's just, just for my personal um, understanding okay. of how the presentation is. Right. So for now, I'm not doing that. If, it, if I okay. can, I'll let you know later because I need to also figure out a few things uh, with, uh, with the organization. Yeah. Okay, thanks for letting me know. I just wasn't sure if it was available somewhere. No, else. it wasn't uh, available. It was just this that was done freely for everyone. Yeah. All thanks, right. Thanks Vidhi. a lot. Thanks, Vidhi. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, who's Hello, Sumi. Tuba. Can yes. Tuba, yes. Yes, Tuba. Hold on. Uh, Hold on. Uh, when, what time we are going to start our... Uh, this is regarding... Yes, Tuba. Yes, uh, Atmanamaste Sumi. I have a question regarding the music and the impact of flute into the higher realms. Uh, uh, if you could highlight more on that. Thank you. All right. I, I'm not too much uh, of a magician or a musician or um, into uh, what I would call the different octaves. All I understand is that um, in the physical realm, you have only the lowest octave that works towards you. And uh, from what I either heard or I read, I can't remember, uh, it was mentioned that the flute, uh, the music that comes from the flute is it does not pertain to the physical octave of the physical world, but actually comes from the next octave, which comes from the next world that is above us, which is the astral world. Atma Namaste. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> That's as far as I can get. I, I, I don't know too much about music. Yes. Atma uh, Namaste. All right. Uh, Ra, who's talking to me right now? Yeah, I'm Sharda Rabla Kumar here. Can yes, you? Sharda. Yes, Sharda. Tell me. Uh, can you please tell me when we are going to start our arhatic practice on the time? I'm, I'm a little lost. In, in this session, are you talking about this session or are other arhatic practices? No, I, uh, I, come, I come to know that uh, there is practice in arhatic uh, yoga. So I just want to ask about that. Uh, uh, okay. I don't know about the time, so I don't want okay. to make that. All right, uh, this is for those of you who are Hatik yogis on the group and would like to join us uh, to prepare ourselves for the Vaisak on the 4th, 5th and 6th. We start yeah. at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, yeah. Details uh, are available. You can contact your local foundation, whichever foundation you belong to or any of the foundations you're aware of and they should be able to give you these details. You can yeah. uh, register. If you're level 1, you have a different registration. Uh, if you're level uh, 3 and above, there's a different registration as well. So we could do it together. That is only for the day of the Vesak, which is the seventh. So three Thank days you. before and three days after, we have Rahatik practices. So you can join there. Thank you, Sumi. You're most welcome. Uh, yes. Can I, ask, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, rather, right? Yes. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, I need to ask you that, like uh, yesterday, uh, day four, you were talking about the uh, hierarchy system and adapts in the masters. And when I correlate this in the Om Mani Padmeham book, where they talk about the eight levels of uh, spiritual development, starting from uh, uh, the development of the 12th chakra, like going on to the heart level, uh, like holy masters, Johan and Bodhisattvas and Buddha. So Correct. how do we... Uh, Dr. Sagar, okay. <laughs> I was wondering who this was. All right, tell me. So how do we correlate this kind of this explanation given by MCKS in reference to the hierarchy or the concept of apprentices and apprentice? Okay, so when we talk about uh, the apprentices and we talk about going into high levels like arhats and holy masters, yeah. I will come to that uh, a little later in the book when we actually talk about uh, the steps in which we can then evolve. Yeah. Okay. In today's uh, chapter, it's still not coming, uh, but it will come in due course. So if I don't address it, Dr. Sagar, please get me uh, back on that so I can correlate this too. Hopefully I will, but if I don't. All right. We'll take last two questions from Archana. Archana Rani. I want to ask that to, it is said that higher we go, the bigger the uh, world, in bigger the plane. So it is uh, regarding the size of the atoms of the or the number of the atoms. The bubble you described that there are certain number of bubbles at the higher yeah. level. So a lower uh, at lower levels, there are uh, atoms means uh, they are tiny in size. No, actually, if you remember, it starts off with forty nine in the highest, and as it comes down, it's actually much more bubbles that have uh, come together. It's not yeah. less. Yes, uh, but there is what is called density within each of them. And the lowest one being the physical, the, uh, the kind of material that is created here, the substance or the matter created here is much more dense compared to if you look at the first world, which is called the divine world. However, mm -hmm. inside each world also you have seven categories. Yes, and the seventh one again being densest. So what is there in the higher level 
is also there in the lower level. Mm -hmm. It's like it's replicated. So when there are seven here, in each of it also has seven. All right, and we're going to go into some more of that a little later. Right? To me, I have a question. Um, okay, Prema. Uh, is the book, uh, textbook of theosophy and the first principles of theosophy the same books? No, <laughs> they're completely okay. different. The okay. textbook of theosophy is a very, very simplified version. And that's why I wanted to take this as a baseline before we go, if and when we go into other books. Yeah. Okay. Thank All you. All right. Last person, Radha Krishnan. Uh, yes. Oops. It went away again. Uh, the, yes. Uh, uh, Come to the parent. Choose the parent and come. If ah! they don't have a child, and when they're going for adoption, how the soul? Hello there. <laughs> oh wow. Okay. Uh, hold on. I'm going to. Uh... Sorry. Okay, ask your question away. Uh, the soul select the parent and come. parents. Okay. If the parent doesn't have kids and they are, they are adopting, how the soul comes to the parent? <laughs> so there is a difference between what you and I would call a biological parent. Yes, and uh, the parent that actually takes care of the soul, nurtures the soul and helps that soul grow. So uh, the point was for the biological parents just to give birth. Uh, so the lesson was to actually uh, to go through the process and actually give birth. And hopefully the, the material from the father and the mother or the DNA of the father and mother would create the material required for that soul on the physical, emotional and mental level, including the physical. Um, however, when it comes to the uh, adopted parents, they are the ones who will nurture or instill in them teachings, principles that they will probably abide by as they go. Yes. So the nature aspect was probably the biological parents, but the nurturing aspect. So there's something called uh, nature and nurture. So the nurturing is done by the adopted parents. Now, the reason why uh, this child is then given to these parents uh, you've got to realize that if they've adopted a child, most probably they couldn't have a child, which means they couldn't bear to physically bring a, a, a baby into the world. One of the reasons I think Master Cho had mentioned is that if in a previous lifetime you have actually abused that um, ability of yours, then in this lifetime, because of what you've done, you cannot at this point uh, bring a child into the world. And so... There is karma to be manifested and also to try and negate that. One of the things that Master Cho would say to a lot of uh, couples who are unable to, at that point, uh, even have a baby was to actually tithe. And this was tithing, um, from what I know, at least two of them, was pretty big amounts uh, to orphanages. So the point was, if you want happiness in your life, because you, most people, uh, the way we all perceive is when there is a child that comes into our lives, there is a lot of happiness and joy. Yes, uh, at whatever level. And so for you to bring happiness into your life or to have a child, you need to then bring happiness uh, to these orphans. When you bring happiness and a smile to their life, uh, then the law with reference to uh, whatever is happening with you and the, the um, karma of bringing a child into this life might get negated. And if that gets negated, you might actually uh, have a child. Sometimes even that is not enough. You might try everything possible and it's still not possible. So this lifetime, it's still not yet time for that to be completely neutralized. And so a child is adopted based on karmas with that particular soul in a previous lifetime, where you will take care of that child, even though he or she was not born through you or um, from you. Yes. All right. So hopefully that helps you. Uh, take care of that question. So th there are always lessons in, in everything, whether it's you know, your own child, whether it's one child, whether you have seven children, I think uh, there's a whole bunch of lessons to learn from every group that, that we have around. All right, uh, so let's move on. Uh, today we go ahead. Uh, so before we start, since I think most people are here, yes, more or less everyone I think is uh, getting here. So please close your eyes, connect down to your palate. Let's invoke. 
to the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grandmaster Cho Kok Sui, to Lord Maha Guruji Meling, to all the great ones, to all the holy masters, holy gurus, especially the beings of knowledge, light and power, to all the host of angels, the masters and the teachers of the Theosophical Society, to all those who are connected and helping us with this session, to our soul and divine self, we humbly ask for your great, great blessings, for your light, for your knowledge, for your wisdom. Help us to absorb and assimilate these priceless teachings, to help practice them and make it part of our lives. We humbly offer ourselves as instruments to continue to become divine servants, to manifest your plan on earth. With thanks and in full faith, so be it. Atma Namaste, everybody. So let's move on. Chapter four is the evolution of life. So in the past uh, sessions that we've had, rather the last one that we had just yesterday, uh, we were talking about what we call impulses, right? We spoke about these various impulses and we talked about seven impulses and therefore creating uh, the seven worlds. So today we're going to go a little further from that. And so we move to what is called the outpouring. And so the impulses that we were talking about earlier, this impulse was referred or is referred to in theosophy as the first outpouring. Yes. So these impulses that we spoke about earlier, which is ultimately then prepared for uh, the solar deity to then create what he has to with his three with his third aspect through his third aspect he continues to create these impulses and then that particular impulse that continues to come in into uh, into this into this solar system is called the first outpouring however today as we move on once this is already created and kept and we also mentioned that when it's time to create planets right However, when all this has more or less settled, yes, once this has already settled, then even within it, the chemical elements, for example, are already created. So most of it is already created. Then the solar deity will, with the second aspect, yes, the second aspect of the solar deity will then release what is called the second outpouring. So that first outpouring is what we spoke about in the earlier chapter. What we're going to talk about in this chapter is going to be the second outpouring, which comes from the second aspect of God or the second aspect of this aspect of God, which is a solar being or the solar deity. Now, when we look at the second outpouring, yes, uh, the second outpouring is basically with reference to the power of combination. So like I said, at this point, there are a lot of elements that are placed in various parts in different worlds that are already created. So what does the second aspect of God do? He will take the elements from all the different corresponding worlds, all the seven worlds that are there. He will combine these elements to start creating organisms. Now, uh, once these organisms are created, the being will then ensoul it. Once it's ensouled by the divine energy, it starts to create, sorry, spelling error there. It starts creating the seven kingdoms. The seven kingdoms are then created at this point. Now, what we are talking about in the last two, three minutes takes eons of time for the whole process to go on, right? But just to understand the second outpouring is basically taking all the material that they have again at this level. Yes, just like they did with the bubbles earlier. So here it's a combination of all the elements that are there. Combine it, create the organism, and then allow the divine energy to ensoul the whole thing. And then starts to create, at this point, the different kingdoms. Now, once the different kingdoms have come into play, yes, so once this whole... Okay, let me stop sharing. So once we have all the different kingdoms that are created we go on further. So let me just come back to this. So um, when we look at the kingdoms that are created, <clears throat> there are seven that are created. Now, most of them are not, <clears throat> are not easily seen by your naked eye. Yes, some of them are visible to your naked eye. Many of them are not visible to the naked eye. And those that are not uh, 
visible to the naked eye <clears throat> in the medieval kingdom <clears throat> sorry in the medieval ages it was referred to as the elemental kingdom now please understand the elemental kingdom that we are referring to here is not necessarily the elements we are talking about in pranic psychotherapy all right so the elemental kingdoms are here so to understand that at this point the divine energy starts to pour its life down and the process of going down yes is going from grosser matter into further grosser matter till it comes all the way down so if you if you look at it it continues to do this till till it comes to a point where it takes the u turn and so let me just share this part with you so it makes more sense and so what does it do the divine energy starts to pour down into matter going into grosser and grosser and grosser matter and this this process when it's going down yes is called the gradual assumption into grosser matter and then when it takes the u turn and comes up it's called the casting of the various vehicles transcending the various vehicles that we would have yes and so basically these are the two stages and so based on these stages and the seven uh, kingdoms let's look at it at this point all right and so uh, to start off with stage 1 yes now with stage 1 the easiest uh, part where science can actually help us to understand this whole process of getting grosser and grosser it starts off on the fifth you remember those uh, energies that we spoke i mean the worlds that we spoke about yesterday let me just go back to yesterday uh so you remember we were talking about the various uh, energies as it comes down right and then it comes down to the mental right so at this level at this mental level is where we are going to come now all right and so coming back to what we are referring to as the first stage it starts off at this fifth level which is the mental level so you have in the mental level there are two categories yes there is the higher mental and the lower mental now remember we said that every world is divided into seven layers correct and so the upper three are considered the higher mental and the lower four are considered the lower mental now in this higher mental is when the the elements are then pulled together yes uh, so let's read this out so it it becomes clearer and i'm not going to make any errors here so what happens is so when it reaches the higher mental it draws together the ethereal elements there combines them into what at that level corresponds to substances and of these substances builds form which it inhabits yes so it's going to then create the substance and then make it such that it can actually inhabit so it's further ensouling within that right what we were talking about earlier so when this happens you create what is called the first element elemental kingdom and that's the first one that we start off with now as it goes further down so that's the first three right so in that first three as it continues to go down it creates a substance it starts to inhabit that and then that divine energy realizes hey i can't stop here i have to go further down and so further down there are four more layers so that is a lower mental again the same thing it will then draw to itself all the elementals that are there and then make it a substance that is required at this level to further go lower into much denser materials in the lower mental and therefore creating what is called the second elemental kingdom now um interestingly once it starts coming here they say that instead of occupying them yes and then releasing it out uh, like it normally does with impulses here what it starts to do instead of withdrawing itself uh, periodically it starts to get attached to this permanently and the the substance or the elementals becomes part of it so instead of saying that this entity or this uh, uh what do you call it um substance that it created is different and it's going to withdraw itself it doesn't it actually kind of imbibes into it it becomes permanent and makes it part of itself 
So from the second kingdom, this is what starts to happen. Now, as it proceeds further, it continues to do the similar thing. Yes, it starts to make the substance more permanent and part of itself. And this time it moves further down into the astral world, creating the third elemental kingdom. Yes, so similar processes from the higher mental to the lower mental and into the astral. Now, when it slowly moves further to the lowest part of the astral and then starts to go down into the etheric uh, part of what we call the physical world, uh, the higher energies, it starts creating what is called the mineral kingdom. Yes, and so it resides upon the, from this lower mental comes into the astral, right? And then moves on. So they say, we speak of all these forms that we're talking about, the first, the second, and the third um, elemental as becoming grosser and heavier. However, these, the uh, substance that we're talking about is far finer than anything that you and I can find in our physical world, whether it's uh, the, the plant kingdom or the animal kingdom or even the mineral kingdom. This is really, really actually quite fine. Yes, but as it comes down for the energy to come down, the energy that is coming down into layer by layer becomes grosser and grosser. However, just to um, remind us that these energies are way subtler than anything that you and I are used to in the physical world. So let me move on from here. And so in the end, uh, the energy comes further down and it's able to now ensoul the etheric part of what we now create, what we talk about the mineral kingdom. And it further goes down for here in the, uh, for here in the mineral kingdom. So when, so when you see mineral, like the gold you wear, or uh, you know, the other kind of material that are out there, steel and others, we don't realize that even though it's a mineral from the mineral kingdom, that it still has life. Yes, uh, we just call it inanimate objects and that's it. But they are still evolving to an extent. Yes, so to remember that life still continues to exist in the so-called mineral kingdom, just like we understand that there is life in the plant kingdom and in the animal kingdom, which we are very aware of, uh, most of us lose sight that there's also life in what we call the mineral kingdom. Yes, and so as you come down, so when you come into the mineral kingdom, you go down one, two, three, four. When you take the fourth one, that is midway, you complete what is called stage one. So the divine energy has now come down, 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 all the way till the mental kingdom, passes through the higher mental, the first three creating the elemental kingdom, the first one, going through the next four, the lower mental creating the second elemental kingdom, going into the astral creating the third elemental kingdom, then coming into the etheric part of our physical form, creating the mineral kingdom and then further going down. Now at this point, that is three and a half almost, that is in the fourth one, it starts to change. And here the stages start to change. So stage one is basically the downward pressure of the divine trying to use its energy to go down into grosser and grosser material. It's called the out breathing. Yes, so the great being is breathing out and through that breath of life, the, the energies are getting down into the grossest level, the divine energy. Now at this point where we have finished with three and a half, then at that point in the mineral kingdom, you start what is called stage two, the upward tendencies, which is basically the indrawing of this divine energy. So this is when we take the U-turn and we start off with stage two. Yes, I hope that's uh, making sense to you. Now, <laughs> moving on to stage two, we're going upwards. Now, this is gonna be very familiar with you. Uh, what I wanted to make you understand was the first part. So stage two. So we're still in the mineral kingdom. We've just taken the U-turn. We, so we finished one, two, three. We're in the fourth one. We still have five, six, seven. And so that is the mineral kingdom that you and I are more or less aware of, both the physical and the etheric part of, uh, of the world. And then from there, so we've, we've turned. So we've gone etheric and we've gone into the physical. Then you go to the next world, which is the astral world. And so with the astral world is connected what you, what you call the vegetative form or the plant kingdom. And it has again seven categories under that. You go into the next one after that, you're going upwards now. So you finish with the mineral, you finish with the astral, that is the uh, plant kingdom. Then you go higher up into the animal kingdom. Again, seven levels. And this is 
into again the mental aspect or the mental development of uh, the ensouled energy of the divine energy. Now, after that, you want to move into what is called becoming a human being, becoming man. And in, in that category, you become what is called your, an individualized soul. All right. So evolution in every level. Yes. Whether you're coming down. Yes. That is stage one. That is the out breathing or the inwarding. That is where you are going upwards begins from always the lowest manifest manifestation in stage two going to the higher. Whereas when you're coming down, you start from the higher going to the low, to, to the, uh, to the lowest. Do you understand? So because you're going into more grosser and grosser, you start from the finest going to the grossest. But when you take the U-turn, it's the other way around. You start from the lowest, trying to evolve to become better and better and better to higher forms. Yes. So I hope that's making sense right now. Sorry. Okay. So let me go back to our book again. So did it make sense for you till now? Is that simple enough? Yes. Hands up. Yes. Okay, fine. All right. Good enough. So this is what we are trying to now uh, make sense of. So the mineral kingdom includes not only what you and I usually call minerals, but also some liquids, gases, and many etheric substances that Western sciences has still not discovered. Yeah. So in that mineral category, don't think of only, you know, your uh, uh, aluminium and uranium and all those things. There's, there is, there are other categories. Now, interestingly, they say that they haven't really categorized all the plants under the seven. Uh, they haven't done research at that point, a hundred years ago, which one comes under which category. So under the seven categories, but they say more or less, it is still there. There are seven uh, divisions, even in the plant and the animal kingdom and in the mineral kingdom. So we have right now reached what is called the central point in the mineral kingdom, uh, which, is, which is what I just shared with you, which is uh, from the downward pressure, we've now taken the upward tendency. <clears throat> okay, so where am I going? Yeah, in each of these kingdoms, there is the definite course of evolution beginning from the lowest manifestation of that kingdom and ending with the highest the life force the life force might commence its career for example yeah let me give you an example to help you understand so say for example in the plant kingdom might start its evolution as grass or moss you know that that green thing that sometimes there on your terrace it might start at that level which is the lowest level and it might end up as a beautiful forest tree that is the way it might move from the lowest to the highest in, in the category of the plant. Now, in the animal kingdom, uh, the example given here, it starts off with a mosquito. Don't think a very friendly one to us, at least. <laughs> it starts off with a mosquito and then ends up as being a, a mammal. Right? And so, uh, even in that category, there is the lowest and there is the highest. Just for you to understand. So, there is division even there. But uh, what we need to remember is that in this whole aspect, we talk about form, yes, uh, which is evolving. But what we're more interested in is the life within the form. The form is important so that the form might be the best quality possible for that life or for that soul to continue with its progress. So the physical form is to an extent important, but more important is the life that exists or uses that form. Yes. Uh, so the focus is usually the, the life within it. So until and unless the animal kingdom comes to the highest level into the mammal, mammal uh, for example, here, only then can it move into the next kingdom, which is the human kingdom. Yes. So until and unless it reaches more or less the higher levels, it cannot really jump that quickly into the next level of evolution, whether it's from plant to animal or from animal to the human race. So we're going to go into that a little bit. Uh, so let me just continue. So when uh, the 
when you look at the whole uh, process of evolution, which is what we're talking about, if you look at it right now, I'm talking about evolution like it is, you know, one category and another category and another category. But evolution or the outpouring by the great being did not occur where it just came in as one, as just one wave of the whole process of moving from the elemental kingdom going all the way up back to the human kingdom, for example. So they say that this whole process, the outpouring is not just one, but it is like ripples that continue at the same time. So though you and I are existing right now as human beings, there is also at the same point, one step behind us, the animal kingdom, which is also evolving. And so one step behind that is the plant kingdom, which is also evolving with a new wave of life sent by the great being. So according to us at our point, yes, there is, we are part of say this A, okay? We're part of the, uh, the wave called A. But with A comes, yes, all the seven, all the seven kingdoms. However, it also has what they say, the second wave that comes just after us. And so the second wave is basically what is existing right now or still in the level of the animal kingdom. And then there's another wave that is coming, which is the third, which is at the level of the plant. And then another one at the mineral kingdom and then the three elemental kingdoms. So there are constant waves of life being, there is a constant outpouring, if I can use that word, of life from the great being. Yes, it doesn't really stop. So it says here, the great deity sends out a constant succession of these waves so that at any given time, we find number of them simultaneously in operation. Yes. And so uh, it says all these, however, are successive ripples of the same great outpouring from the second aspect of the deity. And so it will still continue. And we haven't reached a point where it's going to stop. Not at this, uh, not at this level. Yeah. So let me just show you this before I move on. All right. So we were talking about this. And so... Uh, the outpourings actually starts off like one huge, vast soul. I'm talking about the higher levels, yeah? Not the divine, somewhere between the monadic and the intuitional level. There is this huge, huge, vast soul, uh, which comes from the great being. And then when it reaches the higher mental level, yes, these start to ensoul the higher soul matter or substance that is there within that level. Now, once that is done, so you have from the one, now suddenly it's fragmented into many, many, many bodies of, uh, of what you call higher soul substance or higher soul material at the higher mental level. And then slowly from there, it will now move into becoming individualized soul for man as he starts to incarnate on the earth. Yes. So we're going to go into this process at this point. So a scheme of evolution of which the divine life involves itself more and more deeply into matter continues. And this is what we're talking about. But the point is, in the end, uh, you want to, as a being, uh, possess the spiritual powers at the end before you become one with your high soul. And definitely at this point, one with the divinity or one with God. Okay, let me move on from here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move now uh, to what is called group souls. But just before that, let me just, uh, just talk about this part. So individualized souls of man. Just to be very, very clear, only man or only in the human race can a man have only one soul. Yes, there's only one soul per human being. And also... Each soul can only occupy one body. Even if there are twins, they cannot share the same body. The soul cannot share two bodies. Yes. So each physical form that you have, each physical body that you have can only contain one soul. And each of us have our own individualized soul. 
However, animals and plants do not have their own individualized souls. They have what you call group souls. And that's what I'm going to go into right now. Yeah. Okay, so how do we make you understand this? So when you look at um, the example given here is with re reference to lions. And uh, so they say, for example, 100 lions or a pride of 100, 100 lions would have one group soul. So if you look at the soul energy, the soul energy here is compared to like a bucket of water. And then you take one mug of water that becomes one lion. You take another bucket, sorry, another mug of uh, water, it becomes a second line. And so you can continue from that group uh, energy or the group soul, you can then create a hundred lines. Yes. Now each line. So if you look at that mug that you're carrying with water, that is one individual line. Now, when it is uh, existing in, 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 its, uh, in its habitat, it is individual just like man. Yes, it has its own experiences, it goes through its own struggles, and it has its own way of moving through life. However, if you look at that mug, that let's call it A. Yes, Lion A has a certain experience, say, in, in uh, West Africa, whereas Lion B has a completely different experience in South Africa. And so these two, if you look at the mug, it's almost like you've put a certain color into it. So this one in West Africa has a yellowish tinge to the soul. Whereas the one in South Africa has a reddish tinge based on the experience that he or she had. Now, when this line ultimately leaves the body, the soul, which is that yellowish, uh, yellowish light, the soul light will come back into the bucket of the main group soul and so then that yellow that was there in the mug when added back to the group soul does not have the same uh, bright or rich yellow color that was there in the mug it kind of becomes very uh, light when it's mixed with all the soul energy in that bucket now the same thing when the other line also dies then that red light of the soul comes back again into the bucket. And at this point, again, the red is distributed equally through the entire group. However, once you've poured this red into the group soul, when you take another mug, you can never get the red again, or you can never get the same yellow again. It will be mixed with yellow, it will be mixed with red, and whatever other, other experiences they have. So you see in a group soul, each individual uh, uh, lion that goes out of it brings and then shares its experience with the entire group soul. And so when you take a new soul again that goes out of that group soul, it has the experience of all what the other lions have gone through. And so when we talk about, um, when we talk, when this is what helps me at least understand what you call inherent instincts in animals and birds. Yes, you wonder how this is possible because you see the experience is, is shared equally amongst the whole group. And nothing is kept to only one lion, A or B or C. And so because it's shared, they say it's interesting, even if a hen hatches a duck, a duckling, the duckling will take to water. Because in its, its soul consciousness, that's what it's supposed to do. When a chicken's egg hatches and the chicken comes out, when it sees a hawk flying, it will try to run away. Yes. Now, even if you have a, a certain animal, or say a bird again, so they give the example, if the bird has not been created naturally, but art in an artificial environment, when you let it out, it will still know how to build a nest, even if it did not have parents to teach it how to build a nest. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's already there in their soul subconscious to learn and to adapt and to move on. When I look at these movies about these birds, these migratory birds, I wonder how do they know the route? but it's already in that subconscious of that entire group of birds. This is how it 
it has to be. Yes. And so through the group, it continues to evolve. Yes. And it continues to evolve to go from that level to a higher level to a higher level to a higher level. So how do you understand this? Now, if you look at um, this lion, it is what you call the cat family. Yes, it is never considered part of the dog family, for example. And so the closest that we know that we are familiar with and, and uh, on a regular basis, including outside my own house, yes, is when these group souls, the, the number of group souls in one starts to become smaller and smaller. Yes. And so you're talking about, okay, let me just go back. Okay. So what are we talking about is as they start to evolve. So even this, this bucket of uh, group soul that we're talking about with the lions, as they have greater and greater experiences, this soul energy becomes really, really rich. It becomes so rich that you can almost imagine like a, a division being created in that bucket. So you have suddenly the left half and the right half. And so from now on, you do not have group souls. If they go from the right side, they will ex have the experience and come back to the right side. Do you understand what I'm saying? If they go out of the left side of the bucket, they have their experience and they come back to the left side of the bucket. And so to an extent, it's almost like there are two group souls. No longer one group soul of a hundred. It's like there's a division. So it becomes 50 on one side, 50 on the other. And these 50 will never mingle with these 50 anymore. And so they already become smaller. And then again, they become smaller and smaller till, for example, they come to say, maybe the, the cats outside your house, maybe 20 cats is one group soul from 100. Do you understand what I'm saying? So as they start to evolve, they, their numbers start to become smaller and smaller and smaller. So maybe from a hundred, they become 50, then they become 40, then they become 30, 25, and 20. And by that time, they've, they've moved up on the ladder of evolution to become a cat. Now, interestingly, a cat is what you call a domesticated cat. And so for any of these, any of these uh, beings in the animal kingdom, if they want to move to the next level, which is entering the human kingdom, they have to then develop not just their emotions but also their brain their mind and in order to do this to have further development of the mind they have to come in contact with humans yes so whether it's a wild cat in africa or it's the interesting cat that makes all those sounds outside your house i have enough around my place and then you have the neighbor calling out the name of this particular cat <laughs> anyway so whether it's a domesticated cat Yes, it has to come in touch with a human being. Until and unless that happens, it is not possible for them to move to the next level. Yes, so the domesticated, one, domesticated ones, even if you look at the categories, so in the cat family, it's obviously the cat. In the dog family, it's the dog. Yes, in the monkey family, it's the monkey that comes closest. Um, and then you have, for example, the elephants or the horses. So these are the ones that come in touch with the human race and once they are domesticated they can then jump into the next level which is the human race yes i have some more to share on that i'm hoping i will finish <laughs> before the end of the day all right and so we were talking about group souls so they start with huge numbers so say for example it's it's like a, uh, you see these ants they are like thousands so those thousands and those thousand ants will have only one group soul till they become smaller and smaller and they of course evolve as well to to a different category so the highest point is when you have a single soul and that single soul then moves into the next kingdom which is a human kingdom so method of individualization is coming in contact with man and getting domesticated yes so what is the distinction between the highest animal yes that has reached this level and the lowest of us men so say for example if you call them uh, the tribals or the primitive man so what is the difference between the highest of the animal kingdom and the lowest of the human sorry the lowest of the yes the human race or the human kingdom 
So let me help you understand this last bit before I end with this chapter. All right, uh, so for example, they say, if a man has uh, started off at the primitive level, which is say, for example, it's the lowest level in the human race. Now for this person or this man to have come at this level of the human race, wouldn't mean that he had come to the highest level of the animal kingdom. He would have come from a lower level of the animal kingdom for whatever reason had to leave. And so when they left, they came into the lowest rung of the human race. However, a domesticated, say uh, a dog domesticated, which is almost the highest in the animal kingdom will not become a primitive man. He will become much higher than the primitive man. And so when you get, when the animal gets domesticated, which is not all animals, obviously, then the movement is higher compared to if they had moved from somewhere here, could not go any higher. And then they move into the lowest rung of the human, uh, human uh, kingdom, which is the primitive man. So even their jump depends on where they were before they moved into the human race. And so I'd like to just share a few things before I go on. I'm just trying to get that page for you. Okay, so for example, uh, when you have an animal that uh, you are starting to take care of, like I said, it has to be domesticated. So let me just explain domesticated before I try to uh, un make you understand the other stuff. So if an animal is kindly treat treated, it develops devoted affection for his human friend and also unfolds his intellectual powers in trying to understand that friend and trying to anticipate the wishes of its friend. Yes, you've, you've heard stories about dogs who do some amazing things, monkeys that have done some amazing things because of their love for their uh, master or in this, friend, in this case, a friend. In addition to this, the emotions and the thoughts of the man act constantly upon those of the animal and tend to raise him to a higher level, both emotionally and intellectually. So it's not just that the animal is growing because it's near to you, but because of your vibrations, you also start to influence the emotional and the mental. And that corresponds to uh, obviously an, an opposite and equal, if not more than that response from the animal. And that really helps them go on to a higher level and then jump into a higher level also in the in the human kingdom so to start off with for this first outpouring uh, is not like the others yes uh, sorry not the first the final outpouring so you have what is called we're coming to the third outpouring before i i need to end for this final outpouring is not like the others a mighty outrush affects thousands of millions of trillions simultaneously it comes to each of us individually. And for those who are ready to receive it, this outpouring has, has already started, but it, it has stopped somewhere at the intuitional world before the mental, yeah? So it stops at this intuitional level. So the, this outpouring, the final outpouring has come and it stays there. Now, at this point, what happens is from the lower aspect, which is, for example, the animal kingdom, the animal kingdom has to respond to this. So why are we talking about this? So it says that from here, uh, it can move no further. And so the upward leap has to come from the lower rung, which is the animal. So what does the animal have to do? The animal from below, uh, when this happens, which is called also the third outpouring, leaps out to try and meet this energy. Yes. And so it says in the higher mental, when it starts to respond to this energy, at that point at the higher mental, remember after the intuition is the higher mental. So at this higher mental, it then creates the higher soul. 
for this particular animal. And so at this point, there is formed the higher soul, uh, the permanent individuality. So at the first, it's the first time that this group soul has come out and this animal is now going to have an individualized soul. That's how we move from this level to the next. And so it continues to say that uh, far later, as this higher soul moves down now to becoming a man, he has to now continue to evolve till he takes the U-turn to go back to becoming one with the divine from where he came. So remember we spoke about that vast soul, that vast one soul, at the level of the higher soul, it becomes fragments, taking on whatever it can matter in the higher soul and it waits. It waits for a response from the animal kingdom, from this animal. When that response comes, then from that higher soul, one higher soul, yes, will then come down to individualize and this animal moves into the human kingdom. Did you get that? <laughs> You're just looking at me. Did you get it? Yes. And so it says that this, this, um, the higher soul uh, or the divine spark coming down into the, um, into the higher soul, it says it actually hovers around in the monadic plane, the, the divine spark hovers over the monadic plane, over the group souls through the whole of the previous evolution until and unless this response comes. Once the response comes, then it realizes it's time to come down. And hopefully at this point, there are many, many more animals that are ready to come into the human race. So many more individualized souls will start to descend. Once that soul descends as man, then again, man has to evolve from the lowest rung to the highest, becoming one, one with his higher soul, with his divine spark, and then going back to where you and I came from. <laughs> All right, and so uh, to end this, I have just one paragraph from the, uh, the last lines, actually. It is this breaking away from the rest of the group soul and developing a separate soul which marks the distinction between the highest animal and the lowest of men. Yes. And so moving from here to the next is, it's, is the most important. Yeah. So that's how we've come in and how we moved upwards and how for some reason we managed from the animal state we were in or in the animal kingdom that we were in, we were able to release and, and somehow uh, send the energy up to help ourselves move to the next level and become individualized. Yes, and hopefully right now we are not on the lowest rung of the human uh, level or plane of evolution, but we've actually gone higher. Yes, so that ends it. Do you have any questions? Um, okay, so uh, question, Biju TG, yes. Hello, Biju TG, your hand was up. Is that for a question? Okay, no response. All right. Uh, Rakesh, do you have a question? Do you have a question, Rakesh? Okay, no response there as well. All right. So hopefully this has been easier. Uh, let me see. Uh, where does the human being lie in this stage? I hope I've answered that because this was before I started talking about the human race. So all your questions about the divisions and that, yes. So it can also be called involution and evolution. Yes, that's another name also given for stage one, involution, and going upward is evolution. So when humans pet animals, are they helping them to evolve and get into the human kingdom? Uh, yes, of course. Um, so <clears throat> it becomes, uh, if you notice, the relationship between you and that animal becomes very, very close. You definitely develop more of their astral body and in many cases also their mental body. They become actually a bit more intelligent compared to a stray cat on the road or a stray dog on the road compared to the dog at your place who might, if you say sit, will sit. Yeah, you say roll and it will roll. If you say jump, it might jump. So you're already teaching it how to use its brain to understand instructions and follow it uh, promptly. Uh, so the same thing with a cat. 
uh, or same thing with a monkey. So when you start to teach them certain things, you're helping develop their brain compared to the normal dog, which is out there on the road. Uh, sorry, in India, we have a lot of these stray dogs and stray cats. So uh, that's why I'm referring to them at this point. Yeah. All right. So does the jump depend on the quality, uh, quantity of experience with the human? Definitely. I think... Um, I forgot the dog dog's name in Japan that became so famous. Um, I was there and I saw even the statue of the dog. I forgot, but but it was an amazing story about this dog in Japan um, that uh, they've actually created an idol and placed it outside that particular station. Uh, so you notice that the dog's love for uh, the friend or the master goes beyond uh, anything that sometimes even they say, right? Sometimes dogs are more faithful than humans. So that's what you see sometimes in, in the way you've helped them develop their emotions to such an extent that their faithfulness uh, can, never, uh, can never wither or, or die um, as long as you're around. Yes, and even if you're not there, you'll notice that they still wait for you because of their love and, uh, and their care for you. So uh, yes, it will depend from house to house, uh, the way one person would take care of their dog com compared to another. Now, for example, you find people who are called dog lovers or cat lovers, and there's others who are who don't. I, they don't have a problem with dogs or cats, but they're not lovers of dogs and cats, right? So obviously, if a person who loves dogs has a dog, the way they would treat it, compared to someone else who's not very fond of dogs. So I remember uh, my husband's, <clears throat> I think, financial manager or, or one of those department guys had to suddenly rush off to uh, see his son at the boarding school. Uh, there was an emergency. And they had this dog at home and they couldn't take the dog. And so they asked us to keep the dog at home. Now, when we kept the dog at home, we were okay with the dog, but the person in the house did not like the dog, <laughs> right? And so uh, he was not happy with the dog pooping and peeing, you know, plus it's a new place for the dog. So the dog wasn't responding well. And the person in the house with whom he was for most of the day, because we were out at work, uh, didn't help him. And I, and I noticed that, you know, when the, uh, when, uh, the gentleman and his wife came back, he, the dog was so happy to be back in their arms. You understand what I'm saying? So the experience <laughs> with other people who are not very fond of dogs does affect a dog, definitely. And uh, sometimes you have to do it because of circumstances. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. So uh, the question is, may I know if it is possible for individualized souls move backwards and go back into becoming group souls as far as i understand it is not possible once the gate is open it's a one-way gate yes when the gate from the animal kingdom is open to you to come into the human kingdom you can't go back similarly an animal cannot just uh, go back to becoming a plant yes and so therefore you and i cannot go back to becoming uh, what you call an animal yeah, because that's where the group souls are. If so, is population growth okay? <laughs> well, um, like I said, the plan of uh, the great being, we're all part of that plan. And so if uh, the, the great being has actually let out that breath and we are now moving with that breath, then uh, we are supposed to be here. Whether it's excess population, less population, we are part of the plan. <clears throat> Is it, uh, okay, all right, great, uh, thank you. Okay, sorry, I thought there was a question. Thank you. Okay, where to, uh, what we supposed to work on to be able to get deeper understanding or even the shallow, I'm sorry, I don't understand that. A T L E A S. Shallow, shallow. Sorry, you'll have to um, repeat that, uh, Vijay Lakshmi Parihar. I didn't understand those last words, shallow something. Maybe then I can understand it. Uh, so there will be parallel development, uh, like a human from dog, a human from monkey, 
yes, of course. Uh, so whichever animal is domesticated, they can jump into the human race. So just like the human race is also developing, you will notice that even in the animal kingdom, they are developing. And as um, that evolution is done, so for example, uh, the bird called dodo in Mauritius going extinct is part of evolution. So that animal's um, growth in, in the animal kingdom is done with. Yeah, so there's no more of those coming anyway. Uh, so it will continue till it reaches that point where it can move into the next level, in this case, the human kingdom. Minerals and parts do not have soul. Yes, they do. Uh, just like we spoke about animals having a group soul, even plants have group souls. We spoke about the tree. Remember, we spoke about the grass going up to becoming, for example, a forest tree. So if you're a forest tree, then you will not come as a mosquito. Yes, you might come as a more evolved animal in the animal kingdom. Just like a domesticated animal will come into a higher level in the human kingdom. Similarly, a plant uh, that has grown into, say, even in your, an, an orchard tree that you have, say, an apple orchard. Those apples will go into a higher level because they've already become trees. Uh, sorry, to a higher level in the animal kingdom compared to starting off right at the beginning. Okay, yes, so animals going extinct is part of the evolution. Um, just like we said, there are going to still be new minerals that will still come into existence, which has not yet been discovered by man because that uh, wave is still coming. Remember, we were talking about the impulse, that impulse is still coming in. Cows, why are they revered? Um, you know, Sriram had something to say about that. I can't remember, or was it my husband who was saying something about it? Let me see if I could remember. There was something that they said about the cow. Uh, yes, I think one of the things that they said about the cow, it's one of those animals where you could use everything that came out of it. Yes, the milk, uh, you know, even the cow dung was used for manure, was used uh, even to kind of put the flooring at homes. Uh, so I think to a large extent, it was one of those few animals where you could use everything that came out of it. Um, and therefore, they decided this animal should never be treated badly. Because in the old days, if you look at it, uh, you had to take care of this particular animal. And I think it's my husband who was telling me this. Uh, so uh, you have to see to it that you actually then respect this animal. And so that respect went to a level where you said you cannot kill this animal, for example. Yes, um, that's, that's, my, uh, that's what I heard. And it seemed to make sense to me. And, and I realized, yes, we could do that. All right. Uh, oh, wow. This is a long one. I don't know if I'm going to Godwin. Let me see if I can answer that. Uh, well, I'm just going to do this last question and then uh, end the session. It's, it's time to <laughs> go for dinner. Okay, there, are, there are a lot of questions, sadly. What happened to animals who have been eaten by humans? Uh, well, hopefully... If there is no other means of food, right? For example, uh, Masucha would say in the Middle East uh, or in the areas where there's so much snow, uh, vegetables cannot grow, fruits cannot really grow. And so to survive, if they have to have fish or um, you know, a whale or whatever, or they have to eat meat of animals to survive, it is okay for survival, right? But uh, when, when you do it... Um, when you do it because uh, it, it is something that you need to sustain the body. So certain people, they do need to have, for example, um, soup, uh, which, has, which has to come from the bone for strength or whatever. So it really depends on how you want to take care of your body. So if it is the animal food that helps you maintain the health of your body, then it is okay. So Masachua says there is nothing wrong with that. But however, in due course, if your body does not then respond positively to eating, for example, meat, then uh, you will slowly, automatically, your body is going to start rejecting it and you might have to stop. This is also the same case with vegetables. So you might be someone who is very fond of this particular thing or you're very fond of milk and suddenly you realize your body cannot take it any longer. So just listen to your body and take it forward as long as you don't, uh, as long as we can minimize cruelty to animals. Remember, it's the kingdom below us. It would be good for us. Then, uh, so just take what is required for the body and stay healthy and stay safe. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, so I'm going to end the session. So people who need to go can go. For those of you, I'll give you a few more minutes for questions because even my family is waiting for dinner. So let's close and end the session. Close your eyes, connect onto your palate. Inhale and exhale, relax the body. To the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grandmaster Cho Koksri, to Lord Maha Guruji Neling, to all the great teachers and masters of theosophy, to all the invisible and spiritual helpers, to our soul and divine self, we thank you all for your great, great blessings, for your light, for your love, for your mercy, for your guidance and divine protection. We especially thank you for all the precious teachings imparted to us. Help us absorb and assimilate it and use it to become better divine instruments. With thanks and in full faith, so be it, so be it, so be it. Atma Namaste, everybody. Uh, so just to remind you, tomorrow we are not meeting at, um, at 6.30. We're going to take a break tomorrow. So kindly read up on these four chapters. We'll come back to chapter five on Monday. Um, I will leave a note here uh, at 6.30 saying that today we will not be doing. Just let's do actual study and read up on the book. Yes, at least go through it. Hopefully it makes more sense to you. Thank you. I will just get back to a couple of questions. Um, Nagalata, yes. I just want to know whether the dogs will select the owners for their evolution or evolving uh, for higher. Whether the dog actually selects the owner, uh, as far as I know, um, I'm, I'm not aware of something like that. But okay. will there be a connection? Yes, there might be a connection to that. But um, as such, I haven't read of it. But okay. I'm sure there is. If everything is, comes uh, into your life, I'm sure uh, whether you're going to take care of a tiger at home or, or a dog at home, there is obviously some connection with them. But I, I haven't, haven't read, read it yet yeah. anywhere. So that's just my, my uh, deduction of that. The same. Okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a dog, actually. That's the reason okay. I asked. Sure, no problem. <laughs> Enjoy your time with your dog. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Daksha. Yeah. Please, to me. Yes, that's yes, uh, Yeah, to me, uh, like, uh, if we keep a pet like a dog, mm -hmm. uh, are we helping them to evolve or we are evolving? I'm sure it's both ways because they definitely develop your heart more than some humans around. <laughs> I don't like, but my son is like uh, crying <laughs> for it. And uh, it's a battle for me, like... Uh, so I cannot. You, you know what you can do with uh, having a dog. So if majority win, uh, take it in the positive light that this particular dog will come to your home so that it can get domesticated and get individualized faster. So there's another reason for it. Now, I hope all the questions are not about dogs and cats <laughs> just because I ended on that note. All right. Thank you, Daksha. Thank you. Okay. Let me look if there are, there were hands earlier. I don't know who it was. Okay, and moving on to, uh, oh yes, it was Haiku, correct, Haichi, no, it was Haiku, uh, Haichiko, I think it was Haiku, anyway, so that was the dog, if you can find the movie, it was quite touching, I, uh, one of those few movies that actually brought tears into my eyes. Okay, about a pet again, could this be because of our energy field interaction with the energy field of the animal. I'm sure it is, but uh, more than the energy field, it's also the emotions and the, and the uh, mental body that you want to develop of that particular uh, dog or cat that you have, or any of the other animals, birds as well. Is there any mention about higher planes for extraterrestrial? <laughs> Okay, ET. Uh, well, there are a lot of ETs out there, uh, but it, uh, but the only, um, as far as I understand from Theosophy, the only race that presently has a physical form is ours. The others do have, but they are not physical. They do exist. Yeah. So even if they are flying in their astral uh, spacecraft, you can't see them. All right. Um, and do all animals that's a part of one group soul die together? No, of course not. Uh, they don't die together. They, uh, each animal dies at a different point and comes back to the group soul till it starts to become richer and richer so it can start splitting into smaller and smaller groups. So they, they just continue to evolve that way. 
with more deforestation, so how can there be evolution? Yes, I'm sure um, there will be a break in different things if we are going to, um, I'm going to use that word, screw up uh, the plan. They will take action on us. Yes, so we have to either figure out a way to, to help the plan or if we start to destroy the plan, then something else uh, will, uh, we will have to pay the repercussions for that. Are we going to have bad life as, as compared to the one we have now or it would be better as per evolution? Uh, evolution also, remember uh, Master Chaw says um, with reference to evolution, evolution is got to do with what you learn, what you do, and it also means you and I will make mistakes. And so in that process of mistakes, we are going to also create karmas, negative karmas. And so uh, depending on what kind of karmas we create, the future of our evolution will depend on that. Yeah. So if we become better, then obviously uh, it will be more. So yes, at the monadic level, you could say that there is a <clears throat> one was soul. That's where... You know, that's why Master Chua says, uh, if you look at it, that we all are one, right? Even in the soul affirmation uh, that we are all children of God, we are one with God, we are one with all. So that's where we are all been one. But then as you come further down, you can't come down as one big. So then you split uh, and then you come down further as individualized souls. And that's probably what we're going to do in tomorrow's class. Yeah, um, I need to look at that long one from uh, Godwin. Okay. I've had this thought vision about group souls and individualized souls and the conclusion that I drew upon it is this, which is why other forms of life started diminishing while human life grows uncontrollably, uh, which is why I feel that eventually all uh, most other forms of life will ultimately be eliminated, which is why natural calamities occur. It is to balance the flora and the fauna which is the essential growth, the evolution of higher forms. Okay, he's just giving us uh, his perspective. And at the end, the question is, nine planets came together to form our solar system, not more or less. Nine is a complete cycle, complete number, right? All right, so um, with reference to the number nine, um, at this point, uh, all I would say is one of the things that Master Chua says, remember we spoke about the absolute and from the absolute came three and, and the seven. And so he says, most things are in multiples of either three or seven. So nine is a multiple of three. Yes, 21 is a multiple of three and seven. So all these, mul uh, all these uh, numbers that we use usually come from these two uh, numbers especially spiritually speaking. Yeah. So that is something that you can definitely look at. Um, and uh, if there's more to add, I will get to it later. So does it mean that one higher soul will now incarnate in human kingdom now, and it will not incarnate in lower kingdoms? No, as, a, as an individual, individualized higher soul, you can only incarnate in the human kingdom as one person with one body. Uh, you cannot go down into the animal kingdom uh, because that's not how it works. Yeah. It's like uh, when you move uh, from your country and move into a different country where the customs are different, you might have to adapt to those customs. You can't be yourself because sometimes you stick out and you can be in trouble. Uh, in, in this case, you don't even have an entry. There's no visa going into the uh, animal kingdom or into the plant kingdom. Not possible to go there. Okay, people, I think that's it. Uh, what is ego? Ego is equivalent to what uh, we call in the in Master Choya school, the higher soul. Yeah, ego is the higher soul. Uh, as mentioned, there is, is it the higher soul? Yes, it is the higher soul. Yeah. So anytime you read Theosophy, please equate uh, higher soul to ego. And um, there is a personality which is equivalent to Jivatma or incarnated soul and monad, not monadic plane or monadic world, but monad as the divine spark. Yeah, those are master's instructions. Okay, people, thank you. It's been much longer. I can see y'all are waiting to meet me dear, on Monday, <laughs> not letting me off right now. Have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy time with your family. Cherish those moments. Take care and be safe. 
आत्मनामस्ते